Okay. I decided to take a risk today. Something we never do is talk about the news. We want this to be a place of a spiritual haven where we can come and just sit in peace and support each other. But I felt like I wasn't being true to myself if I didn't talk about the racism and the violence that's been in the news the last few months. And then I had doubts, like, who am I to talk about racism? And yet, who am I not? I'm hoping that you will give me the benefit of the doubt and come together so that we can start to have a dialogue about a very difficult issue that we are facing today. It's embarrassing that in the 21st century, in our culture, that we still have lingering oppression, violence, and racism. And so it was ironic that as I was preparing for the talk today, I kept hearing over and over in my head the Declaration of Independence. And I thought about the beginning of our country, and I, I actually Googled it and read it again. Our Founding Father says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Oops. <laughs> well, let's ignore that part. That only some men were created equal. And women, we were not even on the map yet. So let's ignore that part, but there's some good stuff to be said. Let's just change that word. All people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life liberty and the pursuit of happiness is not something that everybody in America gets to experience. And so it made me think about, I actually came across this incredible article that had just been written by Richard Cassidy, and it's entitled, Jesus and the Roman Empire in the New Testament. And I thought it would be wonderful to take a step back when we're starting to prepare this time when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that we could take a moment to imagine what it was like during the time that he lived. So it depended on who you were and where you were on what it was like. Now, if you lived in Rome, you had it really good. If you were in the Senate or of the equestrian class, you lived a lavish lifestyle. It was awesome. Because basically, you were living off of all the money that had been stolen from the conquered people. And even if you were just living in Rome and you were the general population, they had a program where everyone in Rome got a certain amount of grain every month so they would never go hungry. And they cre created entertainment and all access passed to the forum. It's actually referred to as bread and the circus. And it kept the populace of Rome happy and not questioning what was happening in other areas of the empire. People were being conquered from far off lands and being brought into Rome and actually were made slaves. The military were treated like royalty and they too were sent out to these far-flung territories given lavish amounts of money to keep the oppressed people under their thumb. So if you were Roman, during Jesus' time, you were living the good life. But if you weren't, you were living in hell. And this is the environment 
in which Jesus was born. A little boy from Nazareth in a conquered land ruled by Romans. Nothing special. Who would have been able to predict? I kind of think that whole thing about the star and the wise men and the angels coming and it was all this and that. Well, maybe that happened. But more than likely, it was just a birth like nobody else. Like no, nothing special. It was just a birth. The boy from Nazareth who was being born into a society full of racism and oppression. So why are we still talking about him? It's interesting that when you look at what was happening during that time in the Roman Empire, the oppressed people had different ways of dealing with being oppressed. Some people figured out that if you oppressed your own people, then the Romans would pay you for that. And so that was the tax collectors. And they had a really good gig. And then others just quietly accepted it, said nothing, went about their business as best they could. Others were the zealots who were fighting violence with violence and trying to make a difference in the world. And in the end, they failed. And then there was this young man named Jesus. Nobody special. And yet, we're told that there was a message that he gave that was so profound that think about what a difference his life has had on the world for the last 2,000 years. John Shelby Spong is a, a Bible historian and he breaks it down into these three key components that Jesus' message was encouraging these oppressed people to live up to your full potential, to be that the best you could be. And imagine how difficult that message must have been, living amongst such oppression and violence. And he encouraged people to love wastefully, to love everyone, even the Roman soldiers that lived amongst them. If a Roman soldier were to ask you to walk a mile with him, you were to walk two miles. To love wastefully. Imagine what a radical message that must have been. And lastly, to serve others. That this is where we're able to actually call upon ourselves and bring out the best in ourselves. When we can be of service to other people, we get out of the problems that we have in our own lives and are able to make a difference in the world. So live to your full potential. Love wastefully and serve others. They say that was Jesus' message. Now, the fact that he was crucified might make us think that it didn't go over so well. And that he lived, he died in such a short period of time who would have thought he would have ever made a difference? But we have to think about, this message was so radical that we're still talking about it today. Fast forward 1,900 years. Oh, I should go left to right. 1,900 years to the late 1890s. A couple named Charles and Myrtle Fillmore from Kansas City, Missouri decided to go back to the core of Jesus' teachings and figure out how they might apply them in their everyday life. And they found what they called practical Christianity. Following the teachings of Jesus in this most practical way to encourage others to live the life that they were meant to live, the most potential that we all can have. If you've ever 
read the healing letters of Merlin, Myrtle Fillmore, people from all over the country, maybe even all over the world, would write her letters. They were complete strangers. And they would ask her to pray with them for a healing. And her letters are filled with such love and compassion for somebody who was a stranger. Here was this woman. My aunt says, nobody special. A woman from Kansas City, Missouri in the late 1890s that read the teachings of Jesus and realized in her own life, in her own time, in her own location, that she could love wastefully, love without expectations, to love all other beings. And what a difference it made, not only in her life, but now is still making a difference in ours. And lastly, to serve others. I love the fact that this building was built on the donations of over a thousand people. A thousand people who didn't know us, who thought that it might be a good place to be able to come together and practice spirituality where diversity is praised and peace and harmony are the rewards. And so we can think about this young man who lived 2,000 years ago who was maybe nobody special at the time except he realized this incredible way that we can transform the way we live our lives. And I wanted to share a story about this specific issue. And I'm going to thank Mr. Ace Wagner for this one. There is a training by Arbinger Institute that is built for training companies and police departments on how to treat people as people. Now one would think that this isn't kind of training that you would need, but apparently some people treat people as objects. And so the fun part of this training was at the very beginning there was a police department, I think it was in North Kansas City, I'm not sure, they interviewed a SWAT team. And they interviewed everybody on the SWAT team and they asked him about this one young man that was on the SWAT team. And in the video, everybody had consistently the same thing to say about him. He was arrogant, self-centered, a selfish, well, we'll just say jerk. He was one of those guys that had bravado and walked around and was ready to kick some butt, make a difference. I'm a police officer. I'm on the SWAT team. And none of his colleagues really wanted to work with him. He was part of the problem, not part of the solution. So what was most fascinating is that after we go through this training of learning how we can truly in each moment of our lives see people as people and to figure out how we can serve each other. They videoed the young man after he had been through the training. A couple of weeks after the training, he was doing his usual SWAT team stuff. They had a search warrant that they were going to go um, implement. And the whole thing, you can imagine, they're in the gear, they've got on the bulletproof vest, they've got the guns, and they ram open the front door and there's guys there with guns and drugs. And the young man said they went in and they made the area safe. And there was this one guy in the front room that was being arrested and they put handcuffs on him. And he was just standing there. And so this young police officer went over and asked him if he would sit down on the couch. And the guy in handcuffs said no. So this young police officer knew that the way that he would have handled it normally with great bravado would have shoved the guy onto the couch. And that would have been the end of the story. 
But he had had this training where he was supposed to treat people as people. And so he thought that if he asked nicely and explained why he needed the young man to sit down on the couch, that the young man in handcuffs would do so. So he said, sir, I need you to sit down on the couch because there's going to be a lot of traffic going through here. We're collecting evidence. There's a lot of people that will be coming going in through the house, and I want you to be safe. So would you please sit down on the couch? And the man in handcuffs said, no, I'm not going to do it. So our young police officer, going through his training, knowing that there's a possibility that he could see things from this handcuffed man's perspective. And in the training, he was taught to understand the other person's perspective. And so he took a moment and said, Sir, can you help me understand why you won't sit down on the couch? And the man in handcuffs said, because I was in a shootout two weeks ago and my knee was destroyed, I had surgery that was hours long and I have two pins in my knees and if I sit down on the couch, the pins will pop out and I will have to have knee surgery again. Oh, <laughs> makes sense. And so here's this police officer who had been arrogant, selfish, and self-centered. He said, sir, if I brought a table from the dining room, I mean a chair from the dining room table, and I put the chair in front of the couch so that you could lay your leg out straight, would you sit down on the couch? And the man in handcuffs said, sure. All of that took less than a minute. And imagine what would have happened if he hadn't handled it in that way. But when this young police officer was able to see the man in handcuffs as a person, when he was willing to explore what he didn't know and to ask questions about how he could serve him, how that transformed the situation. And so when I go back and think about what can we do, the Founding Fathers got it wrong 200 years ago. We should not have had a Declaration of Independence. What we really need is the Declaration of Interdependence to realize that we are inseparably interconnected and interdependent with each other and that everybody wants and needs the same as we do, regardless of their external actions or words. We need to dig deeper. We need to understand each other. We need to see each person as a person and not an object. And so sometimes I know it can feel overwhelming. What can I do? What difference can I make? And it's good to have demonstrations and protests and all that. But there are things that we can do in Kansas City that can make a difference. First of all, we have adopted Banneker Elementary School. It's one of the um, lowest performing elementary schools in the Kansas City, Missouri School District. If any of you would consider giving one hour a week, you could make a difference in a child's life. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have prison ministry. And it has been for me the most inspiring thing I have ever done to sit in a room full of murderers and hear their stories and know how much they want to transform their lives. So we can make a difference. We can see ourselves as interdependent. And it might be as simple as just whoever you might see 
asking the question, how can I serve you? How can I serve you? And so I thought we could take these thoughts into meditation. As we take this precious opportunity to sit in meditation together, this precious time to encourage and support each other on our spiritual path, we can take this specific opportunity to reflect on the opportunity that we have to live to our highest potential, to reflect on what we can do, to love wastefully, and to consider how we might be able to serve others. So as we sit in the silence and make that divine connection, we can seek divine guidance in transformation in the silence.
as we come back to this time and this place, just continuing to ponder, what is mine to do? That we declare our interdependence and know that together we can change the world if just a bit. And so it is. Lord of all hope that no one can destroy, be born again in us. In our quiet prayer, in our spoken word, in our prayer, in our movement, Lord of all hope, be born. 